Okay, thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. A very exciting topic, uh, one that's close to my heart a little bit as well. Um, the, uh, the webinar this afternoon is going to be on rehabilitating mining and the title is uh, Thinking Big and Acting Long Term, Exploring Supersize and Sustainable Monitoring Systems for Rehabilitating Mining Regions. Uh, Gavin Mudd's going to be presenting today from RMIT and I'm going to be facilitating this. Um, but uh, without further ado, we might uh, kick off. Uh, my background, I work uh, in Hydroterra. I'm the Director of Modular Integrated Systems. Um, I'm a Principal Environmental Scientist as well. And the presenter today, as I said, will be Gavin Mudd, who's a Associate Professor of Environmental Engineering at RMIT. Um, uh, so a little bit about Gav Gavin. He's been active in this space for 25 years and worked closely with communities, government and industry to contribute to the challenge of developing the vision to understand key environmental, environmental risks, such as tailing dam stability, acid, and metalliferous drainage, erosion, groundwater, groundwater surface water resources, post mining land use and community health. Uh, he has a number of specialties, which is uh, listed in, on the screen there, but it's uh, around the critical minerals, sustainable mining, environmental impact, risk assessment, uranium mining, water management, and impacts uh, in a number of mining uh, minerals, and also the impacts of groundwater and unsaturated flow processes. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, um, click on the Q&A button as it's outlined there. And uh, we have some early bird, we have about 10 early bird questions that we're going to work through. And then where we have time, we'll work through the questions that come up. And even when we can't get to those uh, Q&A questions uh, during the presentation, because it's limited to one hour, we might sneak a little bit over, we'll try and come back to people where we can and, and uh, share those um, answers. What a hydroterra um, run these webinars? Well. Um, really, it's to share knowledge, um, facilitate education, and lead industry. You know, Hydroterra, we specialise in environmental monitoring and integrate system and connections to ensure our clients and colleagues are updated with the latest environmental monitoring and technologies. Um, uh, so, with facilitation of education we, with Hydroterra's clients and colleagues, allow appropriate adoption of our technologies in the future. And we want to be leaders in industry as well by understanding the needs of the industry. We look forward to hearing you and thoughts through the Q and A process. Um, the title of the uh, webinar today is "Think Big and Acting Long Term: Exploring Supersized and Sustainable Monitoring Systems for Rehabilitating Mining re Regions." Um, with and at this point now, I'll hand over to Gavin and. Uh, as we run through it again, we'll just uh, and I I have control as it's as it's as it is with the um, with the presentation. The game will just give me directions to, to move through it. So we'll go first slide. Excellent. Okay, thanks, Steve. And I would I like to acknowledge the traditional owners and the, the custodians of land on which I come from, what or on country myself, but also um, elders past and present, but also acknowledge that uh, I suppose the, especially the interaction with mining and uh, Indigenous uh, peoples and Indigenous interests has uh, not always been a positive story. So I think hopefully through mine rehabilitation that can be an element where we can actually start to address some of that and, uh, and get some positive outcomes on the finish. So thanks Steve. Next slide. So I've been, I guess, involved on in looking at a lot of the, the data around mining for a long time, whether it's the environmental monitoring data to check for compliance, whether it's trying to look at some of these big picture issues as the, the scale of modern mining has become supersized. So if we look at Bendigo, a, a really good example of that uh, would be over 100 years, Bendigo processed something like 25 million tonnes of quartz to produce gold. Uh, and that, of course, finished in about 1954. If you look at the Fosterville mine, uh, just 25 kilometres to the east, uh, in just about 20 odd years, 25 years, it's already processed and dug up probably 50 million tonnes or more. All right, so the, that scale is, uh, is really growing and it's growing exponentially over the last sort of decades. And so a lot of the research I've been doing uh, over the you know, last sort of 20 years is really you know, building data sets on that. Um, with a, a view to thinking about, well, not only do we understand the scale of environmental risk, 
if you've got a much bigger tailings dam, obviously that's a much bigger source term for a potential uh, seepage impacts to groundwater, for example. If you've got a very large uh, open cut mine, that generates a, a lot of waste rock, especially in some sectors like the coal industry or the uh, iron ore industry uh, and others. But it's also the nature of that that waste, and that's something I think we've uh, we really have to pay a lot more attention to now. Whether it's uh, mercury and arsenic, say in uh, gold uh, tailings, or especially historic stuff, but also the risks of acid mine drainage, of uh, you know uh, salinity, um, things like that. These are all the issues that uh, are bread and butter to us, I guess, working in the environmental area in mining. But one of the things I started realizing, a, a, you know, a few years ago is that. As much as we can look at individual sites, we don't really have a national mapping or a national synthesis of the actual status of a lot of these different sites. So I started thinking, well, hang on, I've got a lot of the production data, so let's actually put the dots on the map, and it's very easy to do that in Google Earth, uh, and then uh, separate that out via the different uh, commodities. So you've got uh, lithium, you've got copper, gold, of course, some, you've got multiple uh, metals being extracted, but um, and start to map that out so we can actually start to link in issues such as how much tailings exist at particular sites, what's the status of rehabilitation at, at uh, all of these sites. Uh, but also we can start to map in things like how much uh, sites are now using things like in-pit tailings, which certainly I've argued is uh, a better long-term environmental outcome. And so uh, a couple of years ago, we started collaborating with uh, Geoscience Australia. And so that's now been uh, evolved now into what we call the Atlas of Australian Mine Waste, which is uh, a portal available through uh, Geoscience Australia. So this is sort of my own, uh, I suppose, internal mapping, but uh, it can be used as the basis to say, well, let's look at all of these dots, all of these different mines for lots of different metals or minerals, and we can look at, well, how many of these have been rehabilitated? How many actually have been rehabilitated, say, more than uh, 30 years ago, for example? Uh, we'll come back to some of those as uh, case studies. And I've sort of presented on that through HydroTerra before in the past as well. Right? But a lot of it starts with having good data. And I think one of the issues I've been sort of you know, thinking through a lot lately is how do we evolve our thinking to look at the long-term environmental monitoring around things like successful mine rehabilitation? Because many of these mines are starting to approach the end of their life uh, and uh, will never be reopened again, uh, especially in the coal sector, for example. Um, but you've got some big projects, whether it's uh, you know, in the, the metal space, such as uh, Century, uh, Mount Isa and others, where there's uh, you know, potentially some uh, big issues coming in terms of long-term rehab. And so we need to make sure we, we understand that. Next slide, thanks, Steve. So a lot of these points, I guess I've already been making, but one of the issues that I think I've learned in my own work is that it's, in the digital age, it's very easy for communities to find out about these issues from accidents that happen in Brazil, such as the tailing stand disasters we've seen there, uh, but also Communities live with these issues. If you're looking in uh, many of the different regions, and, and this is not unique to Australia, this is global, communities understand uh, mining, they understand some of the impacts, and they understand when things are managed well. All right? So I think the, uh, something we really need to acknowledge is that if we want to be able to demonstrate success on rehabilitation, we do need to do it in a very transparent way, but we need to link that, um, that transparency back to what the key issues are. And those key issues really come back to making sure that when we've got uh, mine rehabilitation, we know that processes such as tailing stamp stability, uh, acid mine drainage, some of these processes may take decades or, or even centuries to sort of work through, uh, or may actually be a perpetual risk, a risk that basically stays there for uh, effectively millennia into the future. So that's something that we need to keep in mind. When we're looking at rehabilitation, how do we demonstrate rehabilitation, not just in a, you know, a two, three, five year sort of plan, um, but for the long term, and when I say long term, I'm really not talking about five or 10 years. I'm really talking you know, decades to perhaps a century or more. And for some of the mining regions, given the scale and the intensity of how we've mined, such as the, the Hunter Valley and, the, and elsewhere, uh, the, or the Latrobe Valley here in Victoria, uh, I guess we're, we're really having to start to address these issues and think about how do we put in place better monitoring and, and make sure we link all of these issues together. Now, I'm not going to try and say this is a, a, a perfect solution for everything. I think I'll be raising a lot of issues. There's some ideas here that I hope will help. Um, but what I want to do is really help that conversation forward so we can actually start to think through how we um, think about not only the monitoring data, but how we present that, how we interpret that, and, uh, and how we start to link everything together. Next slide. Thanks, Steve. Now, this is a small, uh, often obscure site that most people probably um, don't even know about, but maybe maybe some do. But 
it's one of the very first sites in Australia where we remediated an acid mine drainage problem and a tailing stability problem. Of course, in the uh, 1910s, when uh, the ACT was carved out of New South Wales, the constitutional agreement for that actually mandated New South Wales to protect the Molongo River and therefore Lake Burley Griffin from any impacts from mining. Now, Captain's Flat as a, as a modern mine operated from about 1938 to 1962. It had a couple of tailing sam failures in the late 60s and was renowned as a source of water pollution. And so in the 1970s, the New South Wales government stepped in and did uh, remediation works there through to about the early 80s, I believe. And so it's one of the very few sites where we've actually got um, you know, over 30 years of monitoring data uh, and we can actually really understand that long-term success on, on mine rehabilitation. Now, on the bottom left photo there, you can see the sort of iron staining, that's a, a seepage coming out of the tow drain from the, the old uh, tailing stamp cells. So there's still a tail of acid mine drainage there. When you look at the uh, bottom photo in the middle there, that's the Molonglo River. So you can certainly see where you've got some uh, iron staining there. Uh, a lot of that is associated with old pipes coming out of the old underground mine workings. But the Molonglo River itself is certainly uh, you know, not in a, a dire state. So it's certainly the, the level of impact from the ongoing acid mine drainage um, does seem to be pretty low based on the monitoring reports that, that have been done. So the remediation has reduced the, the source term getting out into the Longway River, and it seems to be a, a modestly successful example of rehabilitation. So I think it's, a, it's an important one, it's, but it's small. It's only literally about 5 million tonnes of uh, total mine waste. So it's a, it's, a, it's a baby compared to other sites where we're dealing with billions of tons. Next slide, thanks, Steve. Now, a more modern example, and is one that I think is um, often argued as a really uh, archetypal type uh, demonstration of, of modern mine rehabilitation is the Kidston Gold and Silver Mine up in uh, North Queensland. Now, it operated for around about 17 years from 1985 to 2002. It uh, was recognized to have a long-term acid mine drainage risk and it's one of the first sites in Australia of the modern era that we've come in and actually applied engineering approaches using things like soil covers as a way to mitigate infiltration and, uh, and sulfide oxidation and so on. And so uh, fast forward um, from uh, the mid 2000s when all of that work was finished uh, to around about five years ago, the uh, proposal came through to actually convert the, the old mine into a pumped hydro storage scheme. You've got two pits there, the Wises pit and the Eldridge pit. Um, and I think from memory, there's about an 80 metre uh, height difference between the base of each pit. And so that's, uh, you know, an ideal candidate for, for pumped hydro storage linked to things like solar. So we can see the sort of triangle and the sort of all the rectangles there. That's the old tailings dam that's now been basically covered with solar panels. And so what we're also seeing is that the, the two pits will now be used for pumped hydro storage. Now, the scale of that is uh, about 200 million tonnes of total mine waste. So, you know, it's a you know, much bigger modern mine, say, the Captain's Flat was. Uh, but one of the things when you're looking at the environmental assessment process uh, to uh, approve the pumped hydro storage scheme, we can look at the monitoring data. So we've got the Copperfield River going straight past the site there. So W2 is where you have uh, entry of seepage waters from um, the rehabilitated mine into the Copperfield River. So if you look at that uh, site or the graph on the bottom right, the W2 is the orange line there. And so the sulfate levels were you know, almost a thousand milligrams per litre. So although we've got modern mine uh, rehabilitation, um, we've still got uh, a degree of seepage impact that's certainly declining over time. So I guess we'll see in the longer term uh, whether this site continues to, to demonstrate success or whether there's other issues that emerge with uh, you know, pumping water up and down through mine waste like that. So next slide, thanks Steve. So if we come closer to home here in Victoria, uh, just to the east of Melbourne, you've got the Latrobe Valley. And of course that's been our, our big site for uh, um, electricity and coal mining or brown coal. Um, and if we look at that, we're dealing with sites that um, you've got in terms of megatons, you've got the Hazelwood mine, which is about 1.2 billion tons in total of uh, coal and uh, 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 an overburden. So that's just right next to the town of Morwell there. And then we've got Loyang, which at the moment is uh, yeah, just a, a, a tad more, I guess. And then your lawn is uh, just a tad short of uh, 2 billion tons. So it gives you a sense of the scale of which the, the amount of waste. Now, if we're thinking about it, 1%, let's, let's assume we get 99% of the rehabilitation absolutely perfect. And we never have to worry about that stuff ever, ever again. 
Now, you know, I don't know any engineer who would actually be confident in giving that level of certification to something like this, but let's run that thought bubble. So 1% remains problematic. So if we've got 1% of 2 billion tonnes, that's 20 million tonnes of problematic waste material that we've got to make sure we're managing and we're rehabilitating and monitoring into the future. Right? And we've got multiples of these sites in the Latrobe Valley, uh, let alone the Hunter Valley, the Pilbara, uh, and so on. So thinking about the significance of that, how can we guarantee we've got 99% right and we've only got 1% of a problem to manage? That really means we have to get good data on the nature of our ways for environmental monitoring, whether it's our surface water, our groundwater, um, often our air quality can be a big issue as we're, we're seeing with some mines in New South Wales and the, in the Pilbara is an eternal issue, et cetera. All right, and so, so again, this data helps us to understand the scale of that rehabilitation challenge and, and thinking about that. Next slide, thanks, Steve. So if we zoom up to the, the Hunter Valley, we can see that again. And, one of the things that's important to compare, I, I guess, between the Hunter Valley and the Latrobe Valley is that sense of scale. The, uh, uh, I don't have the individual mine statistics for the, the, the Hunter Valley. Uh, I have the total statistics for New South Wales, but certainly not the, I haven't worked on the totals individually in the Hunter Valley. But we can see that the, the scale there is several times bigger. And we would expect that the, based on the mining and things like that, you're talking about tens and tens of billions of tonnes, if not hundreds of billions of tonnes, of uh, mine waste that has to be rehabilitated. So that's the scale of disturbance that's been introduced into the system here just from mining. Now, how do we think about rehabilitation of all of that? So we could look at, and, and I think this is one of the grand challenges that we, we all have to face, whether it's communities, whether it's governments uh, and all the different companies, is instead of just looking at one site and making sure we deal with one site properly, how do we make sure we're integrating right across? And I think that that's one thing that I don't think we've been doing that well on. We need to really start to think about these types of systems because given the scale of the problem, and I think that's something a lot of my historical research has always focused on is that scale and you know uh, how big do we need to supersize our environmental monitoring, our re rehabilitation, just as much as we've supersized mining. And I think that's something that we need to think through. So um, let's see what we can find out. Next slide. So if you're looking at, uh, I guess, a visual representation, and this is you know, for some sites around Australia, like the MacArthur River Mine, for example, uh, there's a, a recognition that monitoring has to really be thought through for probably a thousand years. And that's the nature of the waste there. It's a highly reactive uh, sulfitic uh, mine waste, a uh, shale, a uh, pyritic shale. And so really there has to be a, you know, monitoring that thinks through 1,000 years. And so we could look at that and say, well, we've got, um, our really detailed level of monitoring, say our adaptive management might be the phrase, um, and that uh, may be operating over a time frame of, let's say, 10 to, to 25 years, perhaps. Um, and then proactive monitoring, where we're still keeping an eye on things, but maybe with less frequency, and that may occur up to, say, 100 years. And then we basically uh, sort of downsize in some ways our monitoring, because we think there's enough evidence from the, the first two phases that we've got... Uh, stability or that things are, um, are, are heading towards a trajectory or basically have achieved sort of uh, equilibrium and there's uh, minimal risk going forward. Uh, and that would be a good position to be in if that was the case, right? So we can certainly downscale our monitoring at that point, but we still need to keep an eye on these things. So it's when you're looking at uh, mine waste, for example, uh, hydrocarbons can biodegrade, metals can't. So a lot of our, uh, our mine waste, it's a perpetual problem. And one of the issues, I guess, is to, to make a, hopefully a real world example of this. Uh, people may or may not have heard of the Yagas Fontaine tailing stamp failure uh, almost a year ago today. And it was a mine, a diamond mine. Uh, it closed in 1971. Now, it failed in 2022, 51 years later. Now, there was no uh, regulatory system in place. Uh, there was no um, in, in terms of looking at the stability, things like that, a lot of it was just assumed, uh, very min minimal monitoring. There was a hope that it might be reprocessed again in the future to extract some more diamonds out, but um, that didn't happen and it failed before it got to that point. So a lot of our monitoring is not just about the technical aspects of monitoring, the, uh, whether it's the surface water, the groundwater, uh, stability, but it's also making sure we have transparency around that. So if we uh, are starting to see signs and and again, there's a lot more monitoring technologies out there now to look at things like tailing stem stability or safety um, and get some uh, early early warning signs. 
so that we can say, ah, there's some things happening that means we probably need to do something and uh, get in and uh, look at uh, either some maintenance or some emergency works or things like that. So how do we fund that? How do we make sure that when we're thinking about 100 to 1,000 years of monitoring, obviously what we're doing at the moment doesn't address that. A lot of our bonds that we have uh, in various states that are set up for rehabilitation, they're to do the actual rehabilitation works. Very, very little of that, if much at all, is left to funding and setting up a, a mechanism to fund this long-term rehabilitation. So the way that we deal with this so that we don't have this huge liability coming back to sort of taxpayers and governments, we need to think differently about how we fund this monitoring and so on as well. It's not just actually the the what we're monitoring, but it's also how we're funding it. And that's another issue we'll, we'll come back to. Next slide, thanks, Steve. So this is just uh, a good infographic, I guess, from, uh, from Visual Capitalists, just an interesting way they're trying to integrate this. Because ultimately what we're promising to communities and what we need to be able to deliver um, are stable landforms, stable ecosystems, um, and stable water resource systems, whether that's our surface water, our groundwater, we need to understand our, our pollutants and migrations and so on, right? Because that's what's been promised. That's what's been sort of uh, articulated uh, by mining companies and by governments to say, yes, we do rehabilitation. Yes, it always works, but maybe not always, but that's the hope. Um, and at some point we need to be able to judge how do we actually make that judgment that we've got that assessment of good rehabilitation outcomes and it's stable. And yeah, we, we, we can stop worrying. You know, we can actually, um, you know, just keep moving forward um, with, with land use or communities and the environment in that area. So again, so I think it's a nice little way to try and integrate a whole bunch of different issues here. But uh, next slide, thanks. So as I mentioned, the funding regime is uh, is a really big issue. And it's something I guess I've been thinking through a lot is that our funding, and sometimes there may be funding left over for three years or five years. And, and, and in some cases where there's particular circumstances, the monitoring may be required to be done for up to 10 years or, or more, but, but most of the time that's not the case. And so we know the processes that achieve good rehabilitation address risks such as tailing stamp stability or acid mine drainage and so on. They will take decades or longer to work through. So we need to work out how we evolve our current system to say, well, how do we put funds aside to make sure that we can uh, continue to fund this monitoring um, and give us the data we need and give us the transparency so that at some point in the future, we can go, ah, yes, we've actually been pretty good at rehabilitation. You know, it's mostly worked. There's still some issues to work through, but mostly it's been a pretty good outcome. That's what we really need. And so if we're going to be able to go to communities and if we want communities to support new mining projects, we really need to get a lot more sophisticated in how we demonstrate and think about a long-term approach to mine rehabilitation like this. Next slide, thanks. So as I mentioned, we can take the, uh, the usual approach, the very reductionist, look at different flora or fauna, uh, measure erosion, look at different pollutants moving through a mine uh, uh, landscape and after its rehabilitation. Um, and you know, sometimes you might even look at the, the economic issues, the social side, uh, in areas we would hope we're actually uh, better addressing indigenous concerns or interests. Uh, that's not always easy. And given the history of mining and, uh, um, and its interactions with indigenous um, communities and interests, that's not always positive. So we need to really make sure we're acknowledging that and uh, as we're trying to move forward. But one of the things that I think we haven't been doing is how do we make sure we understand the crosslinks? If you're looking at the Pilbara, for example, one of the big issues there is all the, the water that's discharged down sites like Willy Wally Creek changes the cultural values. So when we're thinking about it, we need to understand the, the crosslinks between whether it's water resources um, and indigenous issues, um, you know, for um, communities that are moving into a post mining phase, and this is something in the Latrobe Valley as it is for the Hunter and elsewhere, the, the energy transition as we're calling it, or the, the rise of critical minerals and the, and the decline of fossil fuels means that we have to think about the social and economic. And it's, we've got examples out there, whether it's in forestry or tourism, um, manufacturing. So there are examples out there where we, we have done these kinds of uh, transitions before, um, but not for mining, not on this scale. And that's what's uh, a different, I guess. And especially given the large scale, we need to uh, really make sure we you know, make these links. So a lot of it, uh, I think we have been doing this. This is one of the things, I guess, with some of the work we've been doing in, in collaboration with uh, Richard Campbell and HydroTerra and some students in the, from RMIT over the last couple of years, is looking at whether it's uh, accounting for nature as a, as a framework to look at the environmental accounting of, um, 
uh, say, catchments, uh, or looking at state of the environment style reporting, where we're looking at the sustainability of that environment and that catchment. And we can do that at a global level. I was involved with the UN Environment's Global Environmental Outlook a few years ago, and so it was done at a global level. Uh, we do it for Australia, and we also do it at a, um, at a state level as well. Now, we've never done that for mining, I think. So I think there's some really good opportunities to take some of the ideas out there about how we integrate data, the trends, what that data means, and then say, how do we apply that to mining? So I think that's that to me, I think is something that's uh, potentially quite exciting, um, but it's also how we can start to create some of these cross things between the data. So let's have a look. Next slide, thanks, Steve. As I mentioned, you've got the traditional approach here. So you've got the um, an example for one mine on the right where you've got uh, magnesium and sulfate um, and uh, people probably know me well enough, but th those magnitudes are correct. So one milligram per litre in the surface water, um, a half a milligram per litre of sulphate, say in uh, surface waters before the mine uh, started using land application. All right, but that's for the range uranium mine. And again, that example for the Kidston uh, rehabilitation of the Kidston uh, gold and silver mine in Queensland. So this is long-term data, and this allows us to really link back to these key issues on risks, whether it be acid mine drainage, whether it be water management, um, but again, that's the traditional way we've often done things. Um, next slide, thanks. So with the, my students' work, and this is uh, a, a group um, led by Michael Lowe and, uh, and, and others as part of a group um, that literally just finished recently. And so one of the things they did was an audit of what data is available. And this is just looking as an example of the, the groundwater. And so you can see the, the different areas where some mines make their environmental management reporting public. So there's some, some good site specific data available there. Uh, but we look at the bores that are available on the public uh, you know, database systems through say Water New South Wales, uh, not a lot. So I think we can see where the, the Hunter uh, River goes through. Uh, that's a pretty big system to try and work out. Now, if we're trying to integrate that at a whole of catchment scale, Really, that comes back to, I think, what we're doing with our state of the environment style reporting. So I think what we need to be able to do, and this is a, this is a challenge that all of um, professionals in this space, we always face, is you've got some data that's site specific and sometimes that's not public. It's just dealt with between the company and the, the uh, agency or regulator uh, um, that needs to see it. Uh, or like in New South Wales, all of the annual environmental management reports with all of their monitoring um, are made publicly available. So, and I think that's a great system. But we need to do more than just actually have the data available. We need to actually analyze that data, look at trends and look at the relationships and, and see whether we're heading in the right direction. So next slide, thanks. So if you're looking at it, these are some of the different examples out there. So the, I mentioned the uh, the Atlas of Mine Waste. So part of the work we've, we've done with Geoscience Australia is now complete the um, uh, an updated sort of production data set. So we've got the, uh, for most sites, we've got the production data. For, for many sites, we still don't have a complete history of waste rock, but it's, it's about the best that anyone can do, I think. And so it gives us a sense of looking at uh, some sites like the, the Boddington gold copper mine uh, just near Perth. It's uh, almost half a billion tonnes of tailings alone. All right? And so it's, uh, and you look at sites like Mount Isa where you've got about the same. All right? So then you've got all the extra waste rock and, and other things as well. Now, we're all used to different systems, whether it's the uh, water monitoring type systems, the databases, and, and certainly these have been around now for at least 20 years or more in terms of uh, online, thanks to the internet and so on, um, or more modern systems like the Queensland Globe there, where we're using uh, other tools such as Google Earth and uh, you know, things like that as a way to uh, basically help display information and then provide different layering to look at um, potential connections or overlaps, etc. And then, of course, the uh, good old uh, visualizing Victoria's groundwater, uh, one of the main databases, which, of course, is always a go to for us in the environmental area for groundwater data. So, this is what we've often used. This is sort of things. But what we need to be able to get is a lot of these things starting to talk to each other. And certainly, I think the, the state of the environment style reporting, I think to me, is one of the best ways we can start to do that. And maybe there's more we can um, you know, explore in this space, but um, that's a good start. Let's go. Next slide. Thanks, Steve. So if you look at state of the environment style, I'm going to use examples from Victoria here, being a good old parochial Victorian. Um, but again, we've been doing this for 30 years or, or so. They're not new. We're evolving the, the complexity with the way that we uh, approach things. 
Uh, we're getting better statistical techniques now. There's uh, methods, whether it's the index of stream condition, there's the index of groundwater condition. There's these statistical techniques that are robust, but again, they come back to relying on having good monitoring data right, and having it uh, you know, frequently enough so that you can actually then look at long-term trends over say three years, five years, uh, or longer as the case may be. All right. So then when we're looking at how we display that, and again, taking that data, um, understanding that data, and then trying to explain what all of that data means, of course, that's one of the great challenges. Now, the way that the state of the environment style reports do this is we can look at the trends. So we can see in the little gray box here, we've got the, the trends there on that left-hand column. So it's an improving trend, so things are getting better. Uh, or they're getting worse and deteriorating. Yeah, they seem to be stable, or we're really not sure what's going on. There's a lot of variability, perhaps, um, or perhaps we don't actually have enough data, right? And I think that's a, a challenge that we always face, is that data is important and it generates value. It's not just a cost to actually get the data, but it's also that value in having that data as well. And that's always a, a challenge to make sure we keep the funding flowing to generate that value. The grades basically allow us to look at what's the, the impact. So we can see the almost the traffic lights type approach. We've got green, yellow, amber, and red. So a very high impact in red through to the very uh, green or very low impact. But then another thing that's often very important is how confident are we that we've actually got good data and we actually really understand what's going on? Now, there could be all sorts of different reasons why we might have, uh, say, a limited you know, evidence base that may be limited in time, it may be limited in um, uh, scope or, uh, say, the area that we're, we're monitoring. Um, or whatever, but but again, that confidence in our um, the quality control, I guess, is uh, is an important aspect of how we're looking at data. So that gives us our schema, our, our system to be able to um, start to uh, interpret the data and then explain what it means. So next slide, next Steve. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, a couple of different examples. So you could look at uh, say the Australia State of the Environment Report, the 2016 one, right? And we can see very you know, easily, we can look at different catchments around Australia. So you've got the Carpentaria Coast through to the Tanami, for example, or the, or the Timor Sea Coast, or Tasmania. And we can start to look at that. And we can see areas where you've got nice sort of dark gray circles uh, that are completely uh, you know, filled in. We're pretty confident we understand what's going on. And if we look at the Murray-Darling Basin, it's poor. It's stable, but poor. And that's not good enough. All right, so we can clearly see in the Murray-Darling Basin, we need to be doing a lot better. We need to be shifting that position from that amber uh, where we get uh, an arrow going up and then across into the very good area where we've got a nice uh, sustainable catchment and, uh, and system going on. So we can certainly see there are examples of that. The, uh, the, the Tanawai Timor Seacoast there on the right-hand side, um, we've certainly got uh, an assessment grade of good. The trend is increasing, but our confidence is sort of intermediate. So the other thing here, I guess, which I've also added in here is that comparability. And that really allows us to compare between the different assessments. And that, that could be another factor as well, because things evolve, we get more understanding. So, but also the, the data and everything else can uh, would hopefully improve. So we can see that's another aspect we can add in. But I think the, the thing that I like about this sort of system is that it gives a good visual. It allows uh, us to communicate uh, where we're at, are things getting better or worse and how confident we are. And I think that to me, uh, if we start applying this across a lot of these different areas, it starts us to, to get a sense of that integration and how we can start to look at whether it's other aspects such as social or um, and so on as well. Okay, next slide, thanks, Steve. So this is one from Victoria. This is the, the state of the Yarra report from a, a few years ago now. Um, but again, we can start to see we've got a whole range of different information that's sort of being presented here and similar style to the, the Australian one. Um, where we can see we've got a range that's uh, deteriorating and that's that's quite a lot. That's actually almost half, right? Um, if you look at the sort of pie charts up in the top left there, right? And some other areas where the data quality can be good, um, but the trend is certainly not in the right direction, right? So I think we can then start to look at some other areas where we've got, um, again, question marks on the trend. We don't know whether the trend's getting you know, better or, or worse or stable. Um, there's other aspects where a lot of the data quality uh, is not up to speed. And that's a really important issue. So how can we be confident that we're really achieving good outcomes if our data quality isn't where we need it to be? And I think that's something that we're, we're, we need to solve because if we're going to be confident that we're achieving good outcomes, then that requires good data. Like the age old adage that no data, no problem, I think is, uh, is very dangerous. We need to be making sure we have good data 
so that we can then understand and then make good decisions from. So I think that's ideally where we want to be able to get to. But again, the other thing that stands out from this and, and thinking about how people you know, understand and learn, um, visually you can see there's a, a bunch of red circles there. So obviously that's uh, not where we want to be either. So I think there's a, you know, from a communication tool and from an ability to understand quickly, I think these, these types of approaches, I think of, um, yeah, they really, uh, they work well. And I think they, we can apply them to things like mining and mine rehabilitation. Thanks, Steve. So how do we put all of that together? Next slide, thanks. What we need to think about um, is really a lot of our mine sites are remote. So you've got that sort of there. Uh, I think you're going to sort of help on some of these sort of points if you like, Steve, as well, or you want me to keep going or? Uh, happy for you to keep going and I'll chip in as well where I can. No worries. One of the issues, of course, is that the, the infrastructure can be difficult. Now, whether that's uh, power, whether that's uh, uh, digital, such as uh, telecommunications, um, but also, as I mentioned before, we need to work out how we fund all of this. And so uh, sometimes just to get to some of these particular sites, you could think of the, the Red Bank, the old Red Bank copper mine, which uh, I've often described as one of the most intensely polluting sites I've ever been to. And uh, I certainly don't say that lightly. Um, but again, we need to make sure we're doing these things safely, especially with sites like Red Bank or, or Mount Lyle and many others where we know we've got acid drainage problems and so on. But another issue, which is something I think we haven't uh, you know, thought through much, we think about the range of uranium mine. It's got a legal requirement to demonstrate that it's not causing impacts from solutes derived from tailings for 10,000 years. And I don't know of any other mine that's got that. The McCarthy River mine has a, a trajectory of uh, planning rehabilitation out for 1,000 years in terms of monitoring. But how do we deal with the records and the, um, all of the, the data on that? Uh, I can't access my own uh, electronic uh, files, my old tape drives. I actually still have my old tapes in my, just in my drawer here, um, but I can't even access them. So I don't even have the software anymore. Uh, it's from an old technology from 30 years ago. So it's how do we make sure that we're getting good uh, accessibility um, and we're not losing data and information. It's a, it's a common problem. Uh, no, it's not just limited to mining, um, but we need to make sure we've got these centralized repositories, um, not only just for the actual reports um, and the documentation that goes along with that, but also all of the data, right? whether it's uh, online systems. And I think this is where you know, governments, whether it's our online databases, such as our, our water databases, our mining databases and others, um, we should be setting up, I think, databases that really help look at sites like the La Trobe Valley or elsewhere so that we've got access to the data, whether that's for communities, whether it's for researchers or for companies, uh, but also we can access all of those reports. And all of these systems are out there. The, there's various examples of different systems. There's um, all right, so a lot of it, it straightforward to say there's, there's examples, but what we need to do is make sure we actually implement them and really set them up. And I think the key, one of the key tests especially for communities, will be the, that transparency and ability to access that. And certainly concerns around coal seam gas in Queensland and the, um, the, the groundwater impacts associated with that uh, really led to the establishment of the Queensland Globe, as I showed earlier, um, but also for companies like Santos and, uh, and others to set up their own portals, their own digital systems um, for, for monitoring and for presentations of graphs and all, all sorts of things like that. So there are examples out there. I guess what we now need to start thinking about is how do we integrate that, not just for one project or one company, but how we do that right across whole regions. And so I think I think the, the examples are there, the answers are out there. I think what we really need to do is to start thinking about how we do that for um, the whole of our regions, like the Hunter Valley, uh, you know, long term into the future will be the Pilbara, but also regions, um, you know, say perhaps a bit smaller, like the, um, like the La Trobe Valley, et cetera. So uh, next one, thanks, Steve. I think it's just some of the other sort of more specifics. But again, we've got um, you know, trends and uh, concentrations or all sorts of things. We can look at, uh, we're quite used to looking at all of those things. But uh, for example, many, many years ago, I traveled to the, uh, the, the Philippines to look at the um, legacy impacts from the old Matanduque copper mine. Now, the US Geological Survey had been there about 15 years earlier, done this very big study and so on. But all of their water quality was done during the middle of the wet season. So the concentrations look pretty low and don't look that high. You go there in the dry season when I was there and you look at the water and you go, that's pretty strong acid mine drainage. All right? And we know that when communities have had samples tested from the, the dry season, for example, the concentrations are much, much higher. 
So that seasonal variation is something that we need to deal with. And I guess one of the other issues with that as well is, is really thinking through, uh, especially with uh, risks such as climate change, what that presents both to variability from year on year. And we've seen that more recently in Eastern Australia with some of the severity of droughts and floods coming and going. Uh, but then also that longer term trend around things like changes to rainfall, changes to um, evapotranspiration um, and so on. So we need to make sure we're always embedding these processes, these risks into designing our systems and our, our, our technology, our data, our uh, the actual infrastructure that goes into sites, um, but then making sure that that translates and uh, links to a lot of these sorts of issues. All right, so, but again, any other sort of thoughts there, Steve? Yeah, look, I, I think historically it's been difficult in these remote sites to collect that data because of, as we talked about, you tape sitting in your desk, but we've come a long way in that time. So I think, you know, moving some of those challenges forward and the, and the technology advancements of uh, data capture and satellite technology is going to make a big difference uh, moving forward, especially, you know, the, yep. it's uh, definitely, a, it's a challenge, but it's um, it's a lot e easier now to achieve um monitoring and and actually better outcomes yeah no, absolutely and i think especially as we've got the, the growth in whether it's uh, solar panels and uh, battery systems and things like that so i think the the capacity to to basically build this infrastructure i think is a lot better now than it ever used to be definitely okay i think next slide uh, yeah so basically these are i guess some of the practical issues we have to think about when we're looking at a lot of the monitoring systems uh, but again, all of these types of issues from the actual sensors, the, the actual uh, infrastructure, the power and so on, um, but also the oversight. And it's something that I think we often you know, sometimes forget about or, or maybe don't pay as much attention to. Uh, collection of data is one thing, but if we're not really checking it uh, regularly enough, uh, whether it's calibration, whether it's uh, equipment failure, there can be all sorts of things that can go wrong. Right, so we do need to make sure that we've got those sort of checks there and that requires resourcing. And so that's something that I think we all need to work out how we make sure we've got that, uh, not only the, the technology in place, but also the checks and the review of that so that we're confident in the quality. As I showed earlier, one of the issues that we need to make sure we achieve is good quality data, not just collecting volumes of it, but good quality data at the same time. So um, but again, also making sure we're thinking about accessibility, not just now, but uh, thinking about computers in 50 years time um, and that's a dangerous thought thinking about you know uh, the evolution of computing power over my career so far but let alone I suppose everyone else that's listening as well but uh, but again we have to make sure we're thinking about that because it's uh, we need to make sure that is available not only just for us now but for everyone um, I guess you know decades into the future so it becomes a, a these types of things are uh, might seem simple issues, but they actually have very big uh, consequences or um, some big payoffs, I guess, as well. Thanks, Steve. So, Steve, you want to talk to these ones? Yeah, I suppose uh, we, we've just uh, we've been involved in, and, and working hard on the on the technology, you know, for these uh, robust um, and highly accurate sensors and also telemetry systems, and the introduction of it recently. Uh, um, of low earth orbiting satellite has really brought that price point down and you know historically it was costing thousands of dollars a month to monitor using satellite technology now it's getting down to sort of a dollar a day so it's um, and very compact low power using um you know, using the low earth orbiting um constellations and the, and and it there's a number of those available we, we, we're, we're using um australian made um, sat, uh, constellations through Mariota down in South Australia. We're using uh, the, some swarm satellite constellations. There's um, um, there's a whole range that's, that's making this uh, available and very low power. And uh, and there's more and more um, options coming out year on year. So um, actually monitoring, the cost of monitoring shouldn't be a limitation to being able to collect that really highly accurate data. But consideration around it, the amount of data you need, the accuracy you need is, is also critical um, in selection of what, what you're doing. So, um, you know, we are doing stuff like floating level sensors using um, in pits on mines. Um, it's been, um, it's saving, it's, it's actually collecting better data, more reliable data and saving mines millions of dollars a year and improving safety because they don't have to go 
and get a surveyor out every second day to do mine levels. Just that technology is readily available. Just some considerations around using some of this too. And it's actually just it can, like we said, it can actually save you money and, and collect better data. So you know we are advancing in that end, and, and we have a number of offerings to, to assist our clients to get to that point as well. Yep. Excellent. Okay. Thanks. Next slide. So, what are the key points? We're thinking about the sort of messaging that's been given to communities since we introduced environmental regulation into mining in the 1970s. And one of the key aspects, the key issues there is really that, yes, mines are required to rehabilitate and, and trust us, it always works. And as we've seen with Captain's Flat, yeah, it works pretty well sometimes and, and not well at other times. There's sites like Rum Jungle or Mary Kathleen and, uh, and many other sites of Wakanga where rehabilitation hasn't been as successful as we'd like. So we know that we need to monitor for for more than just a handful of years that we really need to be monitoring for the long term and by long term we typically mean decades to sometimes centuries or more right and the problem we have is that the the uh the, the funding i guess at the moment is really not designed to deal with that the funding is at the moment the way we deal with things from a compliance point of view is a few years after uh, mining or rehabilitation might be finished and so so we need to think that if we're going to be able to demonstrate mine rehabilitation success over the long term and by long term, I mean in 25, 50 years time. So for my students, I set them the challenge of saying, let's say by 2075, how could you look at a region like the Hunter Valley and say, yes, we've got all of the data. And based on that, we have a good evidence base to say we've achieved successful rehabilitation across the region. And so I think that's a question that we need to be thinking about and working out how to solve. And, and so that's sort of whether it's the Latrobe Valley, um, eventually in the Pilbara uh, and elsewhere around Australia. So I think. We need to work out uh, how we fund that and not only that, how we then actually present the data, we make it available um, and then interpret it. And so I think for me, the state of the environment style assessment reports uh, are really valuable in actually helping us to look at you know, whether it's trends, whether it's the, the, the status, whether it's in a good condition, or an average condition or below par and, and not what we want. So I think that uh, that's something we can explore, right? But that's something we need to, I suppose, move the dial on because the regions, whether it's the Hunter Valley, especially in the Bowen Basin up in Queensland as well, I guess, what we're looking at is regions that are fast approaching the need to actually implement all of this and actually do this uh, and then be established and ready so that in 25, 50 years time, we can look back, go through all of the data and actually say, yeah, we did a pretty good job. A few things we can touch up and we can do a bit of maintenance or a bit of uh, re-engineering here. But for the most part, we've actually done a pretty good job and I think that would be a great position to be in. But we need to start thinking about not only the monitoring technology, the data, the systems, and the but also the reporting and how that's communicated to link back in. Um, so that when we're looking at these things, we've got confidence when we're dealing with communities and governments and the industry that, yeah, we've done a great job on rehabilitation. So, um, and we'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Gavin. That's a uh, very uh, interesting topic. We have some questions um, that uh, I'll read out and, and uh, Gavin will attempt to answer some of them uh, as best he can. Some are obviously as related to the topic, um, but still relevant. Um, before we start, I'll, I'll probably throw in one a, a bit selfishly to start with. And um, it, it, it seems a pretty, you've got a very good case to do a state of mine rehabilitation in, in a state, at a state level or Australian level. Has there been any uh, uh, consideration or movement from the regulators or, or the state governments, um, or were you really in that early phase of present, presenting your research and and, and uh, pushing that through? I think it's very early days. I, I think there is a growing recognition in the various state agencies and the regulators and so on that this is something they, they have to address. There's individual sites like um, Ranger or Kidston that have been looked at and there's a lot of work going on for those specific sites but for regions where you've got um, you know a, a lot of mines together um, we can't just rehabilitate one mine because decisions we make at one could affect potentially what happens or what might be possible or not possible at another mine so so I think there is a, um, a growing recognition that yeah we're going to have to deal with this and, and think about all of this in um, very very soon because certainly Latro Valley, Hazelwood's already closed. Your lawns, and you've got a few years left. Uh, Luoyang, yeah, I don't know, maybe another you know, couple of decades at most. But um, so I think there's certainly growing recognition in regulators that yeah, we need to do this. 
Um, we also need to work out the funding that actually goes along with that um, because our current system that we've got, which we've had now for you know the last four or five decades, um, is mostly about being guaranteeing that the money is there to do the rehabilitation, not the long-term monitoring. So I think that's where the, the conversation is changing and that's where I think we're getting greater recognition. But, yeah, there's still a lot more work to do. Thank you. We'll get into these questions. Uh, first one, what role, if any, does biotechnical and GMOs, wetland flora, algae play in rehabilitation? I, I'm sure there probably are some examples internationally. I'm not um, aware of examples myself where specifically you've got a biotechnology approach to um, or genetically modified organisms for mine rehabilitation, but there, there's a case to say it might be possible, but I think we you need to be careful given the, the issues that we've had with uh, GMOs just in agriculture, whether it be canola or other things, I think that's something we want to be very, very careful about. I think one of the other um, parallel questions to that, which I think is probably more important, um, is uh, phytoremediation. All right, so using plants and the um, metallophytes or plants that love you know, sucking up metals out of soil, how can they play a role in rehabilitation and reducing, say, metal concentrations in the surface uh, soils and so on. I, and I think to me, there's some uh, certainly exciting research. And a lot of that's being led by uh, University of Queensland up, to, up there, but um, and as well as there's a, a range of work going on globally in that. So I think there's certainly there's certainly potential, but it, it's something that needs to be looked at carefully. And number two, what could be a post-mining context, a residential complex? Such transformations would demand lots of effort. Yes. Yeah. The, um. All of the above, I think, is probably a simple answer. Kidston, it's both a solar farm and pumped hydro storage. Yeah. Now, that works at Kidston. It may, it probably won't work, say, in the Latrobe Valley, from what I understand. But you, you think about it and you assess it. Um, for some, it may be a large lake. But we need to look at, um, with the Anglesey mine down here in Victoria, the uh, evaporative losses from that lake have to be topped up every year. So where does that water come from? So there's options. And, and sometimes... Uh, Floating solar farms is an, is an example from uh, China and elsewhere in the world, uh, and that helps to reduce evaporative losses, as well as uh, you get the cooling effect that um, helps get a, a few percent more for your solar panels. So, so there's certainly lots of different ideas that people are looking at. Um, but again, a lot of those need to be thought about with respect to the various risks and, um, and how the liabilities are managed and, and so on. So there's lots of different examples and ideas out there. Uh, it's just that we've really got to start thinking about how we actually do it here in Australia. Right. Uh, number three, what proportion of mining waste material in Australia will be free from contamination, potentially toxic trace elements? Yeah, and that's a great question. And it's one that I, I can't give a really good answer to, except uh, there's always going to be some uh, mine waste materials that uh, have residual elements in them that would be potentially toxic or of concern if we're thinking about applying the contaminated site guidelines or the, the NEPM, the National Environmental Protection Measure for um, Site Assessment. Uh, which we typically have not done in mining um, a lot. We're starting to see that roll out a lot more now because if we're changing land use, then yeah, we have to apply the NEPM and the site assessment process. So, um, but a lot of this little level of detail is because we're dealing with sites that are naturally enriched in metals, um, but a lot of the mine waste is probably benign and, and would be reasonable, but some is not going to be or will present long-term risks, whether it's uh, mercury, for example, acid mine drainage or uh, um, or uptake into vegetation, for example. So all of those things need to be thought about very carefully, but uh, it's a very difficult question to answer quantitatively, but uh, it's something that we do need to think about for sure. Okay. Um, number four, what is the latest techniques available to monitor the movement of oxygen and moisture through TSF caps? Yeah, I mean, there's a variety of different sensors that are out there um, as well, for both oxygen and for moisture. Um, and one of the, I suppose, the, the, the challenges there is making sure we've got enough profile. The caps can vary. They can, even when they're engineered to be, say, one meter on average, they can vary from 1.5 to, to 0.2. So sometimes the, the actual the as-built covers may, may be different to what the design was. Um, and that can certainly be part of the problems we see at some of the, um, I suppose, issues with mine rehabilitation performance. But, uh, but yeah, there's certainly a lot of uh, equipment out there. And I think the, it's the same when we look at things like methane, uh, say from coal seam gas operations, uh, we've used methane sensors in, in, say, landfill monitoring for a long time now. So I think we, there are examples of technology out there that we can take from one sector, such as landfills, and then move that across into other sectors, such as mining. So 
So a lot of it, I think, is, is really just looking at the, the, the different equipment, um, making sure it's fit for purpose in terms of the, the TSF cap that you've got, um, and, uh, yeah, and making sure it's uh, all everything's aligned. Number five, besides personal and trusted relationships, how do you build a data sharing network to promote whole of environmental management? Pertinent. Yeah, and that, that's a great question too. I mean, I think these are all great questions really, but, you know, I'm biased, of course. But um, so a lot of it, data alone is, is you know, it's, it's necessary but still insufficient. And I think that's really the whole point is a lot of that comes down to the trust. Now, there are ways to deal with this. There's the whole issue of citizen science, getting communities um, to be involved, with, sometimes with the design of the monitoring, um, the collection of samples that, um, and uh, some uh, training around actually understanding the test results. So when you get a, a particular concentration, what does that mean? And so there's uh, various ways we can do that, whether it's our ANSEC water quality guidelines or, or other aspects. Um, but, but a lot of that, I think, is involvement and actually being transparent. And I think if you don't have that, um, you're never going to be able to achieve acceptance of, of um, outcomes for rehabilitation. So, so I think there's a lot of ideas out there, and a lot of that will, will depend on the region you're in, the communities. Um, but I think primarily it starts with we know we have to be transparent. We know we have to have a good monitoring system. Um, and a good monitoring system is not just taking one sample a year or, or five. It's actually making sure we really take as many samples as we need to really answer the questions that are being raised. So whether that be impact on groundwater, whether that be um, movement of solutes, all of these types of things. So I think a lot of that, it's a, it's a, a complex area, but it's something that I think in my experience, uh, if you do that and engage and, and, and do it with goodwill, I think on all sides, I've seen some really great examples where you can have that great trust um, and acceptance of the, what the monitoring is showing. Yeah. To what extent should rehab be completed when the mine may reopen, reprocess, expand into these rehabbed areas? And that's a difficult question, um, but also very easy. To my mind, I think you come back to a risk assessment and you say, what are the uh, aspects? You could have, uh, and I've seen examples in Western Australia uh, where a gold tailings dam has been sitting there for 30 years and just blowing dust onto the local area. And that's caused problems to the area to the point where sometimes you've got uh, contaminated cattle orders being made. So that's unacceptable. So clearly, I think a lot of that uh, we have to say, well, there's a, 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 an ex sometimes we have to go in and rehab those areas. And if that means that um, it is more expensive to reopen them, if that's the if there is a, a you know another resource there or an expansion of the resource that could be potentially mined in the future, that's the cost of mining that resource into the future. And I think we just have to be honest about that and actually acknowledge that. So um, I think leaving mines in an unrehabilitated state or care and maintenance, I think it's been a loophole in rehabilitation for far too long. I think we need to be honest about that because communities are seeing those unrehabilitated sites and yet they're hearing industry and government saying, but mines are always rehabilitated. So at some point, I think it's in the industry's interest as well as government to say, well, yeah, at some point we need to make sure mines are rehabilitated regardless of whether they're going to reopen or not. Right, so, but it's a, that's a difficult policy question in some ways, but I, I tend to simplify it and say, well, where you've got significant risks, whether that be dust or groundwater um, or tailing stam stability, et cetera, there can be a whole range of different factors, but certainly that's, yeah, that's the way I tend to look at it. Yeah. Uh, cumulative impact assessment and shared resources. BG, water doesn't happen as companies don't talk. Has cumulative rehabilitation different? Well, it needs to be different. And I think that's one of the things that we're realising. In the Latrobe Valley, for example, you had one uh, you know, government utility that managed the whole of the Latrobe Valley infrastructure. And so when that was privatised, of course, the companies did stop talking to each other. And there was the, uh, the, the planning around cumulative rehabilitation also stopped because the SEC or the SECV was actually doing that at the time. I remember going down in field trips in the early 90s and, and seeing that. So uh, what we need to make sure of is that we're thinking about how do we do it differently into the future? So rather than individual companies, um, and we have competition between some of the issues, whether it be with respect to water, but it can easily be with respect to other issues or and so on. But um, so for cumulative rehabilitation, we need to make sure we've got a, some kind of system in place that actually looks at the whole of the region, for example, whether it be the Latrobe Valley, the, the Bowen Basin or others, um, and making sure that we've got the, the processes there. And I don't see much examples of that yet. I think we're starting to think about how we're doing that in, in Victoria, for example. Um, but I think we need to work out that uh, 
yeah, we've, we've got to actually think about cumulative rehabilitation, not just individual mines. Yeah. I'd like to know if reprocessing of tailings is an emerging, emerging sector or strategy to fund rehabilitation projects. It certainly can be, but it, it's, it depends. Uh, if you're looking at the Century Mine, for example, uh, it works well at Century because they worked on a volume model. Now, what I mean by that is they operated on about a, a recovery rate of 70% of the zinc when they operated as a mine from about 99 through to about 2015. And so uh, if you ran the mill longer or build the, the mill processing plant bigger, they could have increased that recovery to around about um, 90% or 95%. So uh, it means that the tailings at Century have actually got a lot of easily recoverable zinc, about the 20 or 25% that wasn't extracted in the first round. So instead of having to rehabilitate a, an extremely large tailings dam, uh, it actually makes sense there to re reprocess those tailings. It reduces the cost of the rehabilitation of the tailings dam itself. Uh, but also, and I think this is sort of what I'm pointing out with my mapping earlier, in-pit tailings, I think, is a much better long-term environmental outcome. Right, you're reducing risks enormously by using in pit tailings as opposed to above ground. All right, so other areas, um, gold has been done many times uh, and it worked with cyanide technology. Uh, for base metals, it can be hit and miss and it can be difficult. Now, if we're reprocessing tailings, which is a lot of the research we're currently um, helping uh, Geoscience Australia with, we may not necessarily go back to the original metal. So if you're looking at copper in Western Queensland, for example, pretty much every copper deposit there, every copper mine, always has cobalt. Now, that cobalt typically reports to the tailings. So if you're going and reprocessing those tailings, you're not going to go for the copper. You might actually just go for the cobalt. Uh, or for some sites, look at the old Mary Kathleen uranium mine, um, it's really a rare earth deposit. So what you might go back and reprocess for is actually the rare earths, not the uranium, for example. And so certainly uh, there can be examples where that's being looked at and that, that, that uh, funding can be used to help with rehabilitation. Um, and in the process, achieve better um, long-term security for things like tailings. So, um, but devil's in the detail. It, it's uh, so if you're doing a non-target element, for example, like cobalt or rare earths, you've got different processing, and that means you've got to be very careful to make sure that when you're when you are reprocessing tailings, uh, everything lines up and your, your metallurgy and all of that works. Because the last thing you want to do is start a project like that, open it all up, only to find it doesn't work, and then you've got a, a mess to clean up. Um, so I think that that's certainly something that has a lot of, um, uh, I suppose, exciting sort of potential, uh, but there's a lot of work to do to make sure that we realise that. So it could be something that really opens up. Uh, in South Africa, for example, a lot of the tailings there are being reprocessed, mostly for gold, a tiny bit for uranium. But, um, and again, that's help, um, how they're helping to fund the rehabilitation of some areas, and they're hoping the with Waters Rand, as, it, as it's called, is White Water River, if you translate it from the original. So re-establishing re some of the original wetlands that used to exist in the, the, the karstic geology there is, a, is the end game they're trying to work towards. And so it's certainly been proving financially successful, but also socially and environmentally uh, successful as well. But it's a long, long process to go ahead. I'm interested to know how we are going to rehabilitate these mines when all this topsoil has been removed. It depends on how the topsoil has been managed. And certainly some topsoil can be put into a stockpile that lasts there for years or decades, and it certainly lost its, uh, its ecological function. Now, there are various ways. There's a lot of research out there to look at how you can um, engineer the, the topsoils uh, to make them more ecologically productive or fertile, I guess, might be you know, one phrase as well. But um, so a lot of that is all very, very site-specific research. Um, since the sort of 70s, I guess, in, in terms of broader environmental management and rehabilitation thinking in mining, uh, where mines typically do protect their topsoil and, um, and, and keep it stockpiled separately. Uh, but sometimes if it's stockpiled for far too long, it, it loses its productivity. So that, that can be an issue, but a lot of that really needs to be looked at at a site-specific basis. Yep. Uh, specific monitoring indicators, targets geochemistry to measure performance slash compliance. What is the long-term instrument reliability? Uh, based on my experience, and I'll, I'll kick over to you as well, Steve, but based on my experience, instruments can last from months to years. Uh, it depends. So, and again, a lot of that varies. It depends on installation. It depends on some of the things happening at each site. Um, and it depends, I guess, also what you're monitoring. If you're looking at processes such as, you know, unsaturated flow um, or groundwater levels, there's certainly some instruments that I think we can be pretty confident last, you know, you know for, for, for years. 
there's others that I guess we, uh, you know, sometimes, yeah, they do last months as opposed to years. So, I don't know, any other thoughts there, Steve? Yeah, and there's, and there's different quality with different um, different instruments, even within yep. categories such as levels. And and there's more and more technology coming out for um, long-lasting equipment at the moment. You know, we uh, yep. a, a new probe has come out from the UK that uh, doesn't need calibration of pH. So, you know, the reliability of that data and taking out that uh, human factor and, and the errors that come with that is is going is very exciting. And um, you know, so there's it's really um, looking at how, how long this modern program goes for and, and picking the right instruments. But there's, the technology is improving and, and making it easier. Yeah, so I think one of the examples I saw recently in an environmental assessment document I saw was someone said that the um, industrial uh, levels for soil for aluminium were 990,000 milligrams per kilogram. This was supposedly a contaminated site assessment, and uh, I mean that's ninety nine percent aluminium metal. So sometimes I think you know we do need to be careful in uh, our reporting and things like that, and making sure we really are checking our units or other things like that as well. But um, but again, it does come back to some of the reliability and um, things and uh, uh, of the actual instrumentation. But again, as you say, the, the human factor because uh, we humans can still make errors, so you still got to be able to spot those and make sure that we uh, don't rely on data or. Uh, other stuff that's you know, perhaps unreliable or, or has errors. Yep. Um, we're sort of running out of time. We have a couple of questions from the Q and A um, that might be worth a quick look at. So uh, we go. But we have one here. How many mine sites are rehabilitated, and those that are at the end of the life, in sort of percentage wise, and what do they do to rehabilitate them? Yeah, I, I think it's one of the reasons why I started putting that mapping together. So, and the, the, the especially the recent sort of um, in a formal data set that we've done with Geoscience Australia um, is because there's actually very few that have actually been rehabilitated. Uh, and then we've also looked at, uh, say, 10, 20, 30 years of monitoring. Right? Captain's Flat was one of those few sites. Uh, Kidston, you would now include as that. So, I think a lot of sites are either in care and maintenance uh, or they're still operating. All right, and certainly we see that in the coal sector, we see that in the iron ore sector, um, you know, even in the gold sector and so on as well. So one of the projects I've got in the near future is to actually start to add some extra columns into the production data file that I've now um, you know, published through with uh, Geoscience Australia to actually say, what's the status of that rehabilitation? All right, so we can actually calculate that percentage directly. And I think that's something that uh, we can look at. But then the other aspect of that is what's, what we would call successful rehabilitation. And that percentage would be much more contentious and I think more, more difficult to try and arrive at a, a, a mutually agreed number at. But that's it's a great question. There's an interesting one here. Um, is growing hemp on the end of lime mine sites an opportunity or an option? Has it happened? I don't know of any site that's done that. Um, it's potentially a good one. You know, um, mm. Hemp is a much more sustainable fibre than, uh, than things like cotton, for example. So it's uh, potentially a very good option and it's something worth looking at, absolutely. Yeah. Good long one. Uh, do you think legislative changes to enforce mining companies to release water quality data is realistic and could be a good start? There's more to this. Um, I know at the moment there are state licenses and annual uh, premium discounts given to companies that release their data under an ISO. Also, introduction of mandatory program to make sure scientists carry out monitoring are properly trained for diet. Uh, data reliability so there's a couple of points to that um yeah i think and and yes i think it's probably the the, the simple answer in in, in, a, in a way i think we um i've always argued that um making things legally required i think is a good is what's required i think we have to do that because otherwise uh if we don't then we'll get variable um engagement or variable response so i think mandating it is a good start i think um uh, but not only that not just the reports I think we then need to start looking at the data systems as well, so that the, the monitoring data that's done, that is available, say, from the environmental management reports, is not just a graph or a table or a summarised sort of statistical you know, parameter, but we can actually get access to the source data where people uh, would like to. So I think, um, you know, in my own experience as well, like with um, NADA accreditation, uh, you do need to make sure that the results physically make sense, they're actually um, reasonable, uh, and that does require training and, and resources. And so... And that's both for the labs, it's both for the uh, regulators in interpreting all of these compliance reports, um, but also for the companies that are doing the monitoring. So that, that, that applies right across the board. So I, I think it's certainly, uh, it's a great question and I think it's something we need to be doing. Um, but many states still don't actually mandate um, release of environmental management reporting, for example. 
So I think that's something that he, uh, other states could do, such as Queensland, the Northern Territory, WA, Tasmania, and uh, and Victoria could all add that, and it would add enormous value to um, collective understanding. There's uh, a continue on from that question uh, as well, but uh, there's more of a statement. Uh, once data is transparent in brackets and reliable, governments could you could make steps towards automated trending and use new technologies such as AI to assist with data interrogation and make decisions to meet closure outcomes. Yep, and that's state of the environment style reporting. That's exactly, I suppose, what I was trying to sort of explain yeah. and sort of talk through. So I think it's uh, the tools are out there. Um, whether we you know, engage AI to help with that or not, um, there's certainly good statistical techniques out there. That's where you um, have a good statistician um, and that's, that can actually happen. Um, so, so I think, yes, absolutely. Right. That's, um, that's pretty good. We've gone through all those questions, which is amazing. There's 14 right. questions there. So I think that brings us to the end of our presentation. I'd like to thank Gavin. Um, it's a really interesting topic. It's a big issue, big problem. Lots of people got to get their thinking caps on to resolve it. Um, but there's been a lot of interest in this as well. So it's a, it's a good start and it's a, a good to see people involved. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, or to Gavin, our, um, our details are on the screen there. If you get caught and you can't find either of us, just uh, get in contact with Hydroterra and, and they'll locate us. But uh, I'd like to uh, f finish up there. And again, thanks, Gavin, for your, for your time and, and the passion around this issue. No worries. And thanks, everyone, for joining in. Thank you. Good on you. Yeah. Bye. Take care, folks.